right, hello, good morning. Um, welcome everyone. We are so, so excited to have you joining us today. My name is Kate Nass, and I'm the Virtual Programs Coordinator for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where we are broadcasting live from Denver, Colorado. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We have an amazing conversation with the Curator of Anthropology, Erin Baxter, in just a matter of minutes which should be very exciting. We also have some friends who will be joining us on camera to ask questions. So thank you again for taking this morning to join us. Before we get started today, I'd like to go ahead and acknowledge on behalf of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science that we are in the land today that is the traditional homeland of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute nations and people. We also acknowledge that the state of Colorado includes the traditional ancestral tribes of the 48 Native American tribal nations who now live in the American Southwest, the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountain region. Um, as far as housekeeping items go today, if you are going to be on camera, we're gonna ask that you go ahead and stay muted and you stay off camera until I call on you. So Bridges Elementary, we'll go ahead and we'll get you pinned later on as you want to ask your questions directly of Aaron Baxter. Likewise, if you are not gonna be on camera or even if you are and you have questions throughout the program, we do have a chat function open. So. Students, teachers, whoever is joining us or has the keyboard today, go ahead and add those questions to the chat and we'll make sure that Erin gets them and she can answer them as we go throughout. Otherwise, thanks again for joining us. We're just so excited. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Dr. Erin Baxter. She's a curator of anthropology here at the museum. Um, so hello, Erin. Can you tell us about, about yourself and maybe what you do here at the museum? Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. It's fun to come to work and then get to just um, talk to folks from all across the country. And I want to thank uh, Kim, who's right off, off stage here as well. So the, the team is excited for to see you all. Yes, I am an archaeologist at this museum. And it's like, I don't know, it's like when you play Little League and you grow up and you get to um, play in Yankee Stadium at the World Series, that feels like what this job is to me. And I, I've gotten to work all over the world in, in Greece and Turkey and Tunisia and Bolivia and Ireland and Virginia, you know, but uh, but I have to say that I'm really excited to talk to you about the Mogollon folks because um, it's sort of like it's sort of like sitting next to a really quiet kid on the bus and you never would really talk to them before and then all of a sudden they have this most fascinating story to tell and that feels like archaeology has finally come to our senses and realized what an amazing culture group this is so i am just it's i'm i'm one of the few irritating people well i'm very irritating but i'm one of the few people in the world who comes to work every day and says this is the luckiest thing i get to do and and working at the mogion region is 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 great but teaching about it is really the icing on the cake so thank you for coming to this classroom and and thank you kate and kim for helping it, help make it happen of course. Well, we're just so glad to have you um, and hear your expertise. Uh, so right off the bat, I would like to go ahead and pose a poll question. So students, if you've got an individual computer, you can probably respond on your own. If not, teachers, if you could maybe facilitate that choice on behalf of the students. The question that I would like to pose to everyone in the audience today is what can we actually learn by studying ancient cultures? Why do we do it? Um, do we do it because we want to know how life has changed since then, how life has stayed the same, how cool past humans were, or maybe a combination of all of the above? So go ahead and take a couple minutes to chime in in the poll. What can we learn by studying ancient cultures? There is a grade on this, right? There's going to be. It's all graded. Everything's yeah. graded. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. We have a couple people chiming in if you've not done so. Teachers, students, whoever's got that keyboard. Chime in. Why and what can we learn by studying ancient cultures? I'll give you another 15 or so seconds. All right, two seconds more. If you've not answered yet, go ahead, sneak in under the wire. All right. So, overarchingly, oh. it looks like everyone chose all the above. Erin, how'd they do? 100%, brilliant. Everyone is brilliant in this classroom. Well done. <laughs> so, so, yeah, why do we study ancient cultures? What can we learn about them? Well, I think the question is, what can't we learn about them? That's, that's the, the science of archaeology. But I do think there's a, a number of old adages in the world that says that if you, if you 
if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going or, or who you are really. And, and also I think that there's, if you don't learn from the past and learn about the past, then you are sort of condemned to repeat it. So there's lots of, of things that I think we, we can philosophically sort of think about, but also I think that um, we are part of a rich tapestry on this planet earth where, which we all share. We are all just, you know, campers on a big old rock and there's all kinds of different campers on this planet and to not hear everybody's story is such a detriment because i feel in my own life that that my life is enriched by diversity of ideas and thinking and people and experiences and i think archaeology and the human race as a whole um in, archaeology enriches the human race as a whole because we bring to life people whose descendants are still around but whose past ways of, of adaptation of thinking of technological advancement of of habitation in places that some people don't even live in now, um, of doing things differently is really a, a contribution to understanding all of human history. And it's really important. And that's why I think it's really important to study the, the not just the big cultures that built the pyramid builders and the cliff dwellers of Mesa Verde, but the people who are sort of living on the edges and in the cracks in between because they have really interesting stories to tell as well. Yeah, so- Very cool. Uh, you know, yeah, no. So like Aaron was saying, you know, even even the quiet kids might still have story. Yeah. So talking about those quiet kids, the Mogion, and honestly, I, I this is new for me as well. Um, I did not know a lot about them until I met Aaron. So Aaron, uh, let's go ahead and just give a give a picture. Who are these people? The who, where, what, yeah. and when? Yeah. They got this really crazy name. They're named after a, an old governor of New Mexico from the 1740s named Don Juan Ignacio Flores Mogollon. And it's named for a sort of a ring of mountains that kind of cuts right through that yellow area. But the Mogollon are kind of one of those culture groups that's a little bit in between. And in a, they're in between because they're kind of hemmed in by mountains and they've got this is really kind of striking landscape and it's really quite high. The elevation is between six and 7,500 feet. So it's rugged. It's, uh, you gotta have a four wheel drive vehicle to get there. There's only limited spots to get perennial or constant water. Um, there's big trees in some places and no trees in other places. The critters kind of live everywhere. The stargazing is second to none if you ever get down there with the telescope. Um, and it got settled, you know, nine or 10,000 years ago, maybe even longer. But it, it's these farmers in particular who started about AD 200 in this region of, of Arizona and New Mexico, who lived in this place and chose to live in this place um, that was really treacherous in a lot of ways. I, I can't tell you how many times I've fallen down those cliffs uh, looking for these archaeological sites. So, but the other thing that about the Mogion, and one reason why I think they're the quiet kids and they're a little overlooked, is that they're sitting in between three loud kids, <laughs> three loud cultures, um, the Chaco, the Hohokam, and the Membres. And, and I think the best way to describe it, Kate, if you will forgive this analogy, is like, when I was growing up, it was like a big debate about influencers and whose rap did you listen to, East Coast or West Coast rap? Um, maybe for kids nowadays, it's sort of like social media influencers about how you maybe look or where places you visit or food you eat and things like that. And the Mogion, because they weren't as resource rich or as well off, I think financially and economically as other cultures, they kind of pointed to whoever was the biggest kid on the block and the biggest influencer. And so early on, they were kind of looking over at the Phoenix Basin and the Tucson area and seeing what the Holcom were up to. And they were living in houses that kind of looked like the Holcom and they had glycerous shell and trade products from that direction. And then a little bit later, when Chaco and places around Albuquerque got going, and these were they were the biggest, loudest kids on the block, the shift came and they kind of looked north and they said, oh, we'll build our houses like that. And we'll, we'll, we'll do things like the Chaco ones did in the uh, a, a communal room that was called a Kiva. They sort of adopted that notion as well. And then a little bit later, they started looking more towards the south, uh, where the Mimbres culture and, and places in Mexico and were influenced by those folks. And this is not to say their own identity was subsumed or taken over by these other cultures, but just that they were influenced by that. And because of that, they're a little bit tricky to identify in the archeological record. Just like we have many identities, like I'm Aaron from Texas, who got raised a Methodist, whose mom's a Yankee and daddy's a Texan. I have many identities that I, and I, I think of myself as an archeologist and a terrible softball player and a really bad at technology and, and a real geek about music. But um, 
But just like that, you've got many complex identities. The Mogion had many complex identities, and they were fluid through time. Because what you are when you're 10 years old isn't the same as maybe sometimes when you're 20 or 40 or 50. And the same is true for a biography of a cultures. They sort of change with the, with the passage of time. Um, and we look for that in how they change their material culture, their houses, their ideas. It's really hard to do, but we're trying really hard to do it as well. Thank you. Wow, oh, really cool. So, <laughs> so they were not so much the trendsetters, so much as the kids who were, uh, what do they call that? Like the, the hype man, where they're like, yes, this is what yeah. we're going to be doing. And they keep yeah. the party going. Um, I love that analogy, though. That is great to think that, you know, trends have been around a lot longer than just like apps and iPhones and all that. Humans have been doing it for thousands of years. So. And that looks like a really cool bunch of artifacts um, from from like, I guess, pottery and ceramics to arrowheads and whatnot. Um, so I do kind of want to dig in a bit more to that. So what can you tell us about, oh, <laughs> archaeologically uh, based puns, gotta love them. Um, <laughs> thanks, Aaron, for laughing. Um, but what can you tell us about the everyday life for the Mogion? Um, what did they eat? Where did they where did they live or, or and whatnot? Um, what was that kind yeah. of like? Thinking back to that video that Kim just showed um, was it's it's a hard place to live and it's probably not a place you would pick, you know, to live. Even today, there are more elk in this area than there are humans. So when you're out there and imagine you're out there with your family, we have got a little kid, you know, a dog, a couple of turkeys, some some pottery. Where would you pick on the landscape to live here? And it's lots of beautiful places. But is there water? Is there is is there a stream or something nearby? Is there flat land that you don't have to clear to sort of to to um, to grow your corn? Is it too cold to grow your corn? Because um, it takes about 90 days to grow corn, you know, frost free days. And when you're at 6000 feet, if you all have been ever above above elevation, a high elevation in the summertime, it's still cold and cold weather, freezing weather will kill your crops. So you're really kind of living on a knife's edge of if you pick to live here and we think that people were choosing to live here because the other places were filled up and they didn't get here in time. And that makes us think that it might have been migrants in particular who were choosing to settle here as farmers. We know that there were people here thousands of years ago who were hunters and gatherers, but it wasn't prime farmland. And when they finally got here, they were really working hard to make a living and living in places um, like this, which is a semi subterranean house. It's called a pit house and you can see the bones of it there. It would have been covered over with um, more sticks and wattle and daub is what that's called. And it's a really nice way to keep the rain out. It's warm in the winter and cool in the summer and a really kind of expeditious like you and I and maybe your classroom could make one of these in a couple of days if we put our if we, if we worked as a team. And so they would they were it was hard and it didn't detract from the rich culture that there was like like you were saying Kate there they have amazing pottery and they have glorious sorts of um, fabrics that we find in caves and things like that they and they were trading we know they had trade goods from as far away as Mexico California and Texas so they weren't isolated or you know bumpkins or any by any stretch of the imagination they just weren't particularly well off but they were still very successful. They sustained themselves there for thousands of years. Um, they made beautiful things, utility wares like this corrugated vessel here. So in that sense, they weren't the one percenters, but they were still wonderful. And I, it's, I think it's a travesty that we haven't really focused on telling their story until relatively recently. That is really interesting. Oh. Um, I also love, Erin, that you've touched on the fact that some cultures we don't really talk a lot about and then maybe some we give a lot of attention to and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about how we how we talk about cultures and how we talk about finding artifacts later down the road um, but overall like what did these people eat and stuff as well oh. um, while we're while we're just thinking about everyday living sorry you asked that and I walked away from you I'm so sorry so early on the people in this area were hunting and gathering and so they were there were, you know, there were elk and turkey and wild critters and all kinds of plants they were eating. Sometimes as many as 200 different species were in their diet. And then about AD, well, they started, they had corn very early on, but about AD 200, they really, really adopted corn. And here's a piece that I found at a site called Tularosa Cave. And that could be anywhere from 
thousand to four thousand years old. That is, yeah, this is my reaction. Yeah, that's uh, a, so that's uh, a four thousand year old piece. Of it art. could be. We we need to, we <laughs> haven't dated it yet, but it's just they're just on the surface. And that from one wow. particular cave, there were thirty thousand pieces of it. But but later they did what was known as the Mesoamerican Triumvirate, and this is probably demonstrating the links to sort of older, more uh, bigger, complex cultures. The big kids on the block. Uh, from Mesoamerica, like Mexico, and, and 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 they had corn, beans, and squash, and that's by and large what the folks in this area were eating. And they were supplementing it, of course, with wild game and plants, but that was their main source of nutritional in, um, intake. Cool. Uh, yeah. And another one. This wasn't this wasn't necessarily planned, but I know Aaron talked about it earlier this morning. There was like one treat in particular that oh, I yes. Think Pretty trendy yeah. that I thought yeah. was really interesting, if you don't mind so hearing. The Mogollon were kind of hemmed in on the multiple mountain ranges in this kind of isolated upland area is what it's called. But again, they were trading shell from Texas and they had beads from, from um, California. But they also had, and this is a brand new discovery in 2019, chocolate. And we found on the inside of a piece of pottery like this one, I'll go over here so it's easier to see, like a piece of pottery like this one, you do what's called residue analysis, which is you scrape and you look at it under a microscope for lipids and and um, and proteins, and they found chocolate in this. So uh, there are two sherds in particular found out in White Sands in the Mogollon region that have chocolate. And I don't know as much about this because again, it's such a brand new discovery. But um, Kate asked a really good question on break about what did the chocolate taste like, and it's not the chocolate like you eat a Hershey's bar today. It's sort of like you would have it in a liquid form. It would have to come from a thousand miles away in Mesoamerica where it grows. So you would have to have the influence or the the chuchipa to sort of be able to trade for that or the power or influence to do it. And then very likely you, you pull open those pods and there's these little tiny chocolate beads. You grind those up into a powder. You would pour heated sort of uh, water on them. And then you get kind of a, a, a semi-sweet chocolate. But in order to sort of take it in or drink it, you would use maybe a cup. I don't have the right cup, but there's a thing called a cylinder vessel that they had at Chaco Canyon. This is our best example. And they would take a couple of these, fill it with chocolate, and then pour it back and forth between them, and it would froth, and you would get a gloriously sweet chocolate cup of coffee, coffee, cup of chocolate. And uh, very likely it was maybe an indication, not just of trade routes, but you had people who had a little bit of influence or the money or the power to say, I'd like a cup of chocolate with my breakfast on Thursday. Why don't you walk the thousand miles and get me some or trade for it or the like? So it's it's telling that they had they had these sort of connections across the landscape. That is so cool. Um, and I know we'll talk a little bit later about context clues, but uh, Aaron, Aaron knows a lot about how fascinating um, just some of these food items or, or pottery pieces are just because it tells such a, an amazing story. Um, and I guess before we continue that story of the Mogollon, um, I would love to hear from some of our friends uh, as far as questions go. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the chat. The chat is in fact open. So teachers, students, if you have those computers, you can post questions there. Um, oh, in fact, we have one. This is a good one. I think Aaron already oh, it. what a good if, question. Could you still eat the corn you found? Erin, would you eat that corn? I, I would not, but uh, <laughs> well, what a wonderful question. By and large, we don't find the kernels on the corn, which one exception I'll tell you about in two seconds. We just find the cobs, the, the, the bits that, that is left over at the end. So that's just a cob, and you can see all the kernels have been taken off, processed, used to make food, and that's the kind of the unedible part. But every once in a while, in places like caves where it's cool and dry and the critters don't get to it, you can find kernels of corn. And in my research, when I was a student just like you, I found in an archive, in a museum, a piece of corn that's the oldest sweet corn in North America. And it was found at a site just north of the Mogollon region called Aztec Ruins. It's outside of Aztec, New Mexico. It didn't have anything to do with the Aztecs. Anglo tourists in the 1800s were very confused. Um, but these Pueblo folks did have sweet corn. And there's actually a difference between the corn that I just picked up, that's kind of field corn, and it's not as, as sweet. You know how when we have something, maybe sometimes you have it on 4th of July and you cover it in butter? That's the sweet corn. That's what we're used to. So field corn is a little bit bitter. It's not, you probably wouldn't want to eat it off the cob. You probably want to pull it off, grind it, make it into a paste, and make a sort of flatbread out of it 
or a, or maybe a soup because it doesn't taste as good anyway, even if you sort of have it. Mm. That makes sense. Good question. Oh, maybe not eating that corn. That's fine. I don't know that I would eat something that was like 4,000 years old anyway. So um, what about, ooh, we have another question. Yeah. Um, is there any rock art depicting the Mogion monster? Yeah, well, okay, so I love this question for a variety of reasons. There's lots of rock art, and it's wonderful rock art. And I know we have this thing, we call it the Mogion, well, I mean, some people call it the Mogion monster. And you know how when, when you don't understand something, you kind of otherize it, you call it weird, or you call it a monster, or you call it something that, because you don't know what it is. Um, and, and there are what are called, archaeologists call them anthropomorphs and zoomorphs. And if you take that word apart, morph means a form of, and anthro means a form of human, and zoo means a form of animal. So an, an, that looks like an animal, an anthropomorph. There's a zoomorph. And there are, there are those are sort of thunderbirds, uh, and the zoonies still sort of come and visit this rock art panel. Um, so there are animals and humans depicted, but sometimes when things get fanciful, when they get like, I'm not sure that that species is still around, uh, modern people don't know what to call them, so they say things like a monster, but very likely the, the folks who originally carved that had a purpose in mind, a name for that creature, or a depiction that we just don't understand. So sometimes calling it a monster is, is not the best thing because it has, it denotes or it connotes or it it gives us ideas that maybe aren't relevant. And this is one of the things that anthropologists like me try so hard to do, which is like everything you learned in your life about, you know, Wi-Fi and, and, and mugs of coffee in the morning and cultures that things that we grew up with and is normal for us. Um, take that out of your head and put it away, because when you're studying another culture, you've got to come at it with a blank slate as much as you can manage and say, hey, that thing on the lower left looks like a COVID virus to me. Well, that ain't right. We know that's right. That is my cultural sort of construct, my brain saying I'm a, trying to assign meaning to this. And that was nowhere in the world of an ancient Mogion person. So we've got to think about like, is that a calendar? Is it a representation of the natural order of the world? Is it a map? We've got to try on new ideas until we can figure out through the process of, of hypothesis testing and scientific analysis what the likeliest thing is. And, you know, of course, that's an elk. Didn't you guys notice? So anyway, I love that question. It, it brings up a lot of, of what, uh, what anthropology is really all about. Wow. Kind of, kind of stepping outside of yourself and putting yourself in the place of somebody that you might know actually nothing about. So that's pretty interesting. Um, let's take one more question from the chat, and then we're going to turn over to Bridges Elementary. So Bridges Elementary, while we're answering this last chat question, if you could go ahead and have those kids ready who might have questions in a minute. Um, Aaron, could you tell us a little bit, what did their houses look like? I know we saw like the pit yeah. house, but where else did they live? Great question. So early on, so about AD 200 to about AD 1000, so for 800 years, three times as long as the United States has been around, they were living in things called pit houses. And these are sort of roundish, semi-subterranean rooms. They're about, well, they're about, they're about maybe 10 or 15 feet wide by about 20 feet wide. Sometimes they're big, so you can get a lot of people in there. And um, again, this is only the, the, the bones of it. This isn't a complete house, but you would fill in that top and it would be all roofed and you would enter sometimes through the roof, like in that ladder, sometimes through the sides. So there would be a doorway, just like, uh, you know, a, a modern doorway. And these were really efficient houses. They look sort of simple to us, but really they, if you think about how much we invest in our houses and how long they last, um, the cost analysis of it is that the houses are the most expensive thing we, we do and own. Um, and, and for Pueblo people, it was more important to have something quick and comfortable and, and housed a lot of people because you weren't going to spend a lot of time in it. You lived in Arizona and New Mexico. It is beautiful. You want to be outside. You just want to be out of the rain, out of the snow and up, have a safe place to sleep. So that's what these pit houses were. Later, when Chaco became influential in the north, they started building things out of rocks. But really, I think the pit house is really an ideal thing to do. And if ever you go camping and if you have a chance to sleep in a pit house, I highly recommend it. It's beautiful inside. Oh, I see questions. I see humans. Yes. Nice. Oh, oh, humans. We, are, we are ready for Bridges <laughs> Elementary. I'm going to go ahead and add you to the screen and spotlight you if you would like to go ahead and ask Erin your questions. Hello, Bridges Elementary. 
So my name is Gabriel, and my question is, do you accidentally find something that you didn't need to find? All the time, Gabriel, all the time. So one of the things that way archaeologists find sites is we get all of our friends together, or maybe three or four of them, and we line up really spread out. Like if you guys, you could do this on your playground or something like that, a, a field, and you spread out and you've got a friend 10 feet this way and a 10 friend, 10, a friend 10 feet that way. And you look on the ground and you walk in a straight line across the, across the environment, over mountains, through dales, through shrubbery, you get all cut up. And you're looking on the ground for anything on the surface. And in, in the US Southwest, you find pottery and you find pieces of projectile points and things like that on the surface. And so between you and your friends, you kind of see a large swath, a large area of land, and you find sites that you had no idea were there just by teamwork and looking on the look, looking around. And then when you dig and you excavate, it's just every time is a surprise. Sometimes you hit absolutely nothing and you put in all that work and you have a hole with nothing in it. And sometimes you hit wonderful things like some pieces of pottery that we'll show you in a second. Does that answer your question? Yeah, cool, thanks. Nice monster shirt. <laughs> that was a great question. Hello. Hi. Well, my name is Yasmin and my question is, do you accidentally break things? Yes, yes, yes. Do you accidentally break things? Oh no, yes, I mean you're just gonna make me look terrible. Um, archaeologist, right yes, uh, you you can't see this right now, but I actually have a broken foot right now, so I do this all the time. But yeah, we do break things on accident. So um, when I was a baby archaeologist and I didn't know any better, uh, you know how we dig in holes, and I jumped into the hole one time, and I and just below the surface there were some artifacts and I ended up breaking them and I thought oh man so from now on I sort of creep gently into places but by and large archaeologists are known for being very slow very meticulous and very careful with the things that we find because one they're precious and limited they're a finite resource two we want to save them as best we can for students maybe like you guys I mean if you grow up and become an archaeologist and three they belong to a culture that I, that is not mine. They belong to ancestral Pueblo people, modern people. And I want to make sure that I am a good caretaker for that object. So I do on accident break things, but I try very hard not to. Is that okay? That's a great question. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. Hi. What was your motivation to become an archaeologist? Well, I was really bad at chemistry. No, <laughs> um, I love archaeology. I, I went to summer school for chemistry, so I made up for that. But I, I love archaeology because one, you, everyone who does it loves it because um, it's about being outside. It's about working in a team. It's about problem solving and it's about science. And very often, unless on days like this, I can wear jeans and boots and flannel shirts to work. And so all of that made me think this is a pretty great job to have. Does that sound okay? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> very cool. Let's go ahead and snag maybe two more from Bridges Elementary, and we'll have another Q&A session later as well. Hi. My name is Brady, and my question is, is your job ever life-threatening? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I spent some time in a Bolivian prison and I got kidnapped briefly by some Berbers in Tunisia. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the weather is probably weather and bears and lightning are probably scary. Um, I, 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 my first dig when I was about 18, I went to Tunisia and I excavated um, in a Roman, well, it was a Roman site and they had filled everything with um, sewage. And so I was excavating down there and I got yellow fever. <laughs> um, so an ancient, I was vaccinated against this, but it was apparently a kind that had never been seen before. So I'm a medical mystery. Um, but yeah, it is, it is life threatening, but it kind of keeps things interesting, if that helps. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying desperately not to break things or die on archaeological sites, but it, it is, you do fall down and cut up, cut yourself up and, and, and fall in holes and, um, and get diseases. And, and I was just in Jordan this summer and I, I, I threw up on a World Heritage site. So yeah, I guess it's life threatening, but fun. <laughs> if you live to tell the tale, it's it's worth it, right? 
Wow. <laughs> this is all news to me as well. That was an amazing question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. That was maybe too much information. <laughs> Good question. That was great. All right. Last question from Bridges Elementary. Molly, um, my question is, what is the most interesting, most interesting thing you've ever found to Bridges? Um, when I, well, this is probably, I shouldn't tell the story, but when I was in graduate school at the University of Virginia, I worked for the National Trust and I was working on a, a site called Montpelier, which is an old estate of a guy named James Madison. Can I ask your classmates who in the back has heard of James Madison? Can y'all raise your hands? Yeah, yeah, he's the guy who wrote the Constitution. And anyway, I was working in the cemetery, the Madison Cemetery, and I actually dug up, accidentally dug up part of James Madison, but I put him back. He's back in the ground, but he 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 got moved out of his coffin by some animals and, and I found part of him and identified him. So it was not it was I, I found the arm that wrote the Constitution, but again, I put it back in the ground. But in the Mogion region, <laughs> the most interesting thing, I think, is some of the pottery. And if you don't mind, I'd love to show you some of that in a little bit. Is that OK? Good question. That Thank you. Amazing. That was so good. Thank you for <laughs> those incredible questions, everyone. Um, what a wow these are amazing stories uh, like i said there's a million things that i have never heard of until i, I hang out with aaron and then i learn a million new things every day um so kind of on that note uh, i guess when we're talking about how we make these discoveries and how we study archaeology today um what is the science behind archaeology especially for our folks who might want to become archaeologists yeah. how do we study sites today well we we can do a different, like I told you about archaeological survey, where you get your friends and you just sort of walk across the landscape. We're also really good about also, we're getting better about collaborating with communities whose ancestors these were, and they're unbelievably informative about um, where to look and how to look and what kinds of questions to ask. So these are, um, that's uh, Eldon and Rami and they're Zuni elders and they are helping us excavate. So this is something that's a relatively new thing where archeologists haven't reached out to, to collaborate with our, with our neighbors. And we're of course, both extraordinarily interested in, in understanding the ancient past. Um, it's all, so there's scientists and indigenous folks working together side by side. This is me taking copious notes uh, from Ronnie Caccini about how things were, um, how he, he perceived this site. So it's, it's that, it's collaboration, it's learning about science. So I, I always, um, I remember thinking in school, like, I'm never going to use this, or I'm never going to think about this again. Like, how does trigonometry impact my world or, or chemistry or, or art history, or, you know, you always have a subject that you think, oh, I'm never going to need this. The anthropology uses everything. It uses your whole brain. And that's one other, going back to that uh, question from that young uh, woman from the last class. I love that because it's like something new every day. They say, Aaron, you've got to curate an exhibit on Egypt. Fabulous. I'm going to school. I'm old, right? I'm out, I've been out of school for years, but I get to go to school all the time for a new idea, a new subject, a new scientific technique that I didn't know about before. And I love getting to learn all the time. I think it's such a treat. And I'm jealous that y'all are still in school because it's the best time. It really is. That didn't, I got off topic there and philosophical. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's great. School is so fun. And if you work in academia and research yeah. and all sorts of things, you are effectively a student for life. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, earlier we were talking about some of the technologies. Uh, Kim, oh, do we yeah. have B-roll and we have footage maybe yeah. of what those different kind of technology yeah. like how do we do we do we just dig up sites i think right now there's kind of like a an overarching i want to say stereotype that when you're an archaeologist or an anthropologist you just take a shovel and if you dig you find things which man that would probably be nice but i know it's not always the case so how do we find things yeah um, in the underground we're we're getting smarter about it i think these days so uh, you know 100 years ago an archaeologist would say hey there's a site take a shovel and go find things. And you kept only the big important things and you discarded everything else. Like I worked at a site where the guy threw everything in the river because it was too small to kind of be, to bother with. And, uh, and they destroyed the whole site in the process. And now we're kind of like, wait, we don't want to do that because I know that science is a, is a progressive thing that we get better at it. I'm better than my, my teachers at science. I think a little bit, and I hope you are going to be better at it than I am. So we don't want to destroy whole archaeological sites. We want to just sample them, take a tiny 
excuse me, a tiny little bit so that we save the rest, one, to preserve it, one, so descendant community members aren't upset with us because we're messing up their ancestors' site, and three, because scientists like you down the road will still have a chance to go back and see it. So in order to do that, we're coming up with new technologies like remote sensing, where we can send um, different sort of wavelengths into the ground to uh, see what's under there without digging it up without spending the time or the energy to do it, but getting data that we can use without messing up the ground. And so that's a, a what's called sort of preservation archaeology. It's not that we're not ignoring the site. We're just trying to impact it as little as possible. It's kind of like 20 years ago, if you ripped up your knee, they'd cut you open from your, the middle of your thigh to the middle of your shin, and it was this really intrusive surgery that would mess up all kinds of things to fix your knee and now there's orthoscopic surgery where they poke little holes in you and they can do the same thing. That's what archaeology is trying to do today. We're trying to use technology and better thinking to not to, to come at with new questions, new techniques, new ideas and save these sites for future scientists like you. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, when we're thinking about these sites and uh, there's a couple that you have studied and I know we're we're getting towards the end of our program and I do want to have more questions available, but what are some of these sites that you visit where you make these findings and use these technologies? To, yeah, to study so the, the reserve Great Kiva is one that we the, the people at this museum have been studying in collaboration with Zuni cultural advisors from Zuni Pueblo and here's the site it's a great Kiva. And this is a, a big building and you'll see humans walking around there to give you an idea of the scale, but it's a big square building. Do you guys see that? And those are our excavation units in the middle. And this is where people would have come together to meet each other, perform ceremonies, rituals, other events. It was kind of like a mosque, a synagogue, a rec room, a church, um, a gym, not, not a gym, but you know, like a place where people could come together and you could fit a lot of people in there. Um, and we are trying to come about it the smartest way we possibly can. And we know it's not perfect, but we're, we're getting better. So before we put a trowel in the ground, we asked Zuni cultural advisors, want to, do you think this is a good idea? Should we learn this? Should we, can we learn about it together? And then we picked really small sections of it. There's Octavius Seotua. He is a chief at the Zuni Pueblo. And we dug little tiny test trenches into this kiva. And we took so many notes, y'all, hundreds of pages of notes. Um, and we're really careful about the artifacts. We're going to make sure those are examined microscopically. They're all washed. They're taken care of. They're recorded. And the idea is, is that we'll we'll store these for a little time in the museum, and we'll write reports, and we'll put it on the web, and we'll make it available. So when archaeologists like you or or your or you know future archaeologists, young people who are right now can come to this museum and study these sites, and they're not locked away and lost and and forgotten about. And that's really the, the object of archaeology is at the end of the day, we're storytellers and we're storytellers for people who can't tell their own stories anymore. And we have to be as faithful to what their lives were like as we possibly can. And science is helping us do that. Very cool. And we um, didn't actually move that fast. That was time lapse. <laughs> uh, wishful thinking, right? right? Um, <laughs> if you could do anything that fast. Okay, so that was the Great Kiva Reserve, and that was a, a really neat site. Um, what about, uh, I think we were, earlier talked about a Tularosa Cave? Yeah, um, oh yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so Tularosa Cave is one of the oldest sites um, in, that was occupied. It was occupied like 4,000 years ago, so there's Tularosa Cave. And there are, there, there are 33,000 corn cubs found there. 200 sandals, what we call perishable artifacts, things like clothing, hair, like wooden objects like this were found in this cave because it didn't get moisture in there and it didn't rot away. This stuff, all of the stuff I talked about, if it was outside of the cave over 2000 years, it would go away. When this was found in 1907 by a guy named Walter Huff, it was filled to the brim with things and people had been living in there for 4000 years. Um, and it's all cleaned out now. It's just, it's totally empty. So an archaeologist now can't go back and say, hey, what did you find? And if it wasn't written down or notes weren't taken, and they weren't great in 1907, um, then we don't, we've lost a lot of information. But we're using a new technique at this cave called Bayesian analysis. We went to the Chicago Field Museum where some of the artifacts still are. And we're doing a new study of corn cobs and sandals to find out 
that that cave wasn't occupied for 4,000 years. We're going into, this is like a lab in the back of a, of a museum where we, we find these artifacts and they're labeled and carefully taken care of. Um, but they led us to come back with new questions. So Walter Huff said, oh, it's an it's a old Indian cave. That's what he called it. And we think they lived there for a thousand years. 50 years later, uh, a guy named um, Paul Martin from the Field Museum said, oh, I know how to do radiocarbon dating. It's this brand new technology. And I can tell these stories. There I am getting very excited about it. And now we're going back in 2021 and 22 and saying, we got a new technology, Bayesian analysis. And we think these guys were sometimes right, but this cave wasn't lived in the whole time. There was a period of time when things were going really badly, about AD 900, and they left and there was nobody in there. And these are the kinds of, we're getting better at telling the stories with the technology. So even in the last hundred years of science, we've been able to revise what happened at this cave. And maybe you guys can help us tell the next version of this story. But in the interim, you gotta go visit it, it's beautiful. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so one thing I guess uh, that stuck out to me too, and we saw like that, that lab um, with the, the cool table and there were like all those old sandals and artifacts in there. Um, earlier you mentioned something called context clues and why is it important that we sometimes leave these sites actually untouched and we're not yeah. taking everything out? I love, I mean, there's nothing better than like touching something like tangible, right? We're all kind of tactile learners. We want to touch it. And I can't tell you how many times folks have come up and said, oh, Aaron, Aaron, I found this artifact in, um, on the, in the field in my, my grandparents' ranch or out in my backyard. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm so glad you have that. I'm so glad you have this little piece of history. But this little piece of history that's going to go on your mantle or under your bed or in a box somewhere, it's now separated from its story. And its story is what we call, what you were talking about, like context, we call it provenience, which is what it's found, where it's found and what it's found with. What if you found this point like this next to a bone of an extinct animal, next to a hearth, next to a house? All of a sudden you have a story of where people lived, how they were hunting, what animals they were hunting, pollen analysis if you you could look and see what what residues are on there is it blood is it is it plant remains is it, what was this used for and all of that together that's a real story when it's by itself like this it's really cool and i know everybody loves to sort of take the take something home uh, with them a souvenir but this is a piece of the past that's never once it's missing it's missing forever so it's non-renewable it goes away and it and that breaks my heart just a little bit but I get it, but it still breaks my heart. I guess kind of on that note, um, you know, we, we touched base on this as well. It sounds like when we study a lot of these things, um, not only are we trying to not be invasive because we use new technology, so we're not damaging stuff, but also, you know, the relationship we build with the ancestors of, of these people. Um, how, how would you say we can study this um, in a way that's kind of respectful and yeah. Um, responsible. What does it look like yeah. to be like a responsible archaeologist? Oh, what a good question, Kate. Yeah, it, I mean, 100 years ago, archaeologists went everywhere across the landscape of North America and dug wherever they wanted. And and about 30 or 40, 50 years ago, maybe they sort of started saying, man, there's indigenous community members out here, and maybe they would be good collaborators on this. And maybe after the dig, you would go and take them stuff and show it to them or things like that. And that wasn't ideal either, right? You never like to be asked to sort of, after the fact, to sort of help with something when the, when the ideas are already there. Now we're getting better about not just um, not just sort of cooperation in, in research, but collaboration, like really a meeting of minds. And so what we're trying to do here is really, really make context with indigenous communities who are just as interested about um, their past as archaeologists are and, and work from the beginning of projects, not at the end, but all the way through. And, and learn from each other. And it's an invaluable and a really rewarding sort of process. And I do think that's sort of an ethical way. I also think it's really important that if you dig something up and you don't write about it and publish it and save the artifacts for a future generation, then you are, that's, that's, that's the worst kind of science. That's not even science. You are, you're what we call a pod hunter, kind of a, kind of a, a pirate in some ways. You take that which is for yourself. And it's the, it's the notes and the, and the documentation and the, the recording that it really is important. I think those two together is sort of an ethical, ethical means of doing archaeology. Cool. Yeah. 
Well, um, Bam, this has been amazing. I love the questions that our friends in the audience have had. Um, I wish we had another hour to talk about this. Erin, is there anything you want to kind of close up the chapter of this, <clears throat> excuse me, this conversation on? Um, anything you want to leave our, our friends on well, Zoom with? I would just say they grew corn, beans, and squash. I'm just looking at the questions. They have storytellers, music, art, games, running activities, everything we have so outside the same sort of technologies they had. They had rich and compelling stories. I wish you could hear indigenous folks today tell stories. You would hold your sides laughing. Um, the rim has been surveyed by LIDAR. That's very good. Look to the University of Arizona if you like. Um, but I, I I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm so grateful that this museum and, and, and students like you who are interested in sort of not looking at the, the loudest and the biggest and the most opulent sort of, of, of our ancient past that now we're looking in sort of the, the dark corners and the places that have been passed over because um, I just think because you're the, you're the quiet kid or, or the, the one who doesn't sort of speak up the most, it's not that you don't have as much to say, we just have to work a little harder to get a story from you. And when we get it, it's really enriching and valuable to all of us. So I think that's my metaphor for the archaeology of the day and why Mogion mysteries are something that I hope we get to keep looking into. Love it. Very, very cool. Well, thank you, Erin, for yeah. giving us this morning and this amazing storytelling session. Um, you are incredible. Thank you so much for Bridges Elementary. Those were amazing questions. Without them, we wouldn't have gotten some of the information that we did. We were so glad to have you on camera as well. Thanks for the rest of the folks in the chat. Um, thank you for Kim. I know you can't see her, but she's behind the scenes making magic happen. Um, we we're just so glad that everyone joined us today. So on that note, um, I would like to go ahead and put in a plug for our next, uh, our next Scientist in Action. It's going to be on Tuesday, October 25th. Um, we are going to go out to the Rocky Mountain Arsenal here in Denver, and we will be hearing with friends um, who are going to be doing kind of exams on a herd of bison, um, which is pretty cool. And actually, there is going to be some kind of similar content and how we how we relate to the public and relate to ancient cultures through the study of this bison. So anyways, um, thank you again. We really appreciated you being here and uh, have an amazing day. <laughs>